You were saying that the uh, ribosome reads the um, messenger RNA by these three letter codes. Um, when it's done that, does it read four, five, and six, or can it leave four alone and read five, six, and seven? Uh, so, so Francis Crick proved in the uh, early 60s that the code is triplet, that is three at a time, and it's not overlapping. So you would read one, two, three, and then you would read four, five, six, then you'd read seven, eight, nine, and so on. So it doesn't, so there's no overlap. Because there's a question, would you read one, two, three, and then would the next one would be two, three, four, for example? And it, it doesn't happen that way. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, my question is, uh, if you could solve uh, any protein structure, uh, what would you choose? Ooh. Today. Today or tomorrow. Yes, we'll let you, <laughs> we'll let you have the night off. It's a bit well, like going I on mean, a desert island. They didn't ask you, you know, which protein I, I you'd like to sell. I don't sell. really think of it. I, I don't think of it that way. I, I think of it as you have to think about what is the problem, what is the question you want to solve. You know, in, in, in this case, it was, you know, how is the code translated into proteins? And in order to answer that fundamental problem, you had to solve the structure of the ribosome. So you have to ask, what is it that you're interested in? You know, if you're interested in vision, then you might want to ask, you know, how are the proteins, what are the proteins involved in vision look like and solve those. Or if you're interested in memory, uh, then you might, you know, consider what is involved in memory and then uh, look at the structure of those. So I think you should really think about more about the, the question and then go after the key components uh, of, of that problem. I wouldn't, otherwise you become a bit of a trophy hunter, you know, and say, oh, I want to go after this protein. Well, if I were, young, if I were a young, you know, if I were a young man today, I would, I would probably want to work on the brain and ask, you know, how is the brain constructed? How do we uh, store ideas? How do we retrieve them? How do we, you know, act on them? So I think there's a lot of work to be done there. But it might not necessarily lead to structures right away. You might have to, it might, you might have to understand circuits and how neurons form circuits. So not everything is structural. And but I at, at some point, it will become structural. Once you understand circuits, then you've got to understand how the circuits work, and then you'll go back to structure. But so, sometimes structure is premature. You have to uh, get the underlying phenomenon first. And I have to ask you, Venkit, now you're president of the Royal Society, which is something for an outsider and, you know, someone who didn't really do that well early in your, <laughs> your <Yes>. career. <laughs> but, <laughs> but your mother, if you told her that at, you know, at, when you were 19, she would have just thought you were mad. But anyway, so, uh, but you were a bit dismissive about physics and uh, you couldn't find any interesting problems. Now you're president of the Royal Society. Have you changed your view of physics? Oh, I, I was never dismissive of physics. I, I, was just, I was just worried that I, the problems in physics were very, very hard to make headway on. And I was questioned, and I was working on a boring problem in physics, I thought, okay. Uh, possibly it's because I didn't have the aptitude or, or something. So, I, so the lesson I drew is never work on something you're not interested in. Because if you, if you do that, you really won't do well. You know, you, you just won't, your heart won't be in it. Uh, but I think physics is an amazingly elegant, beautiful discipline, you know, because it, it, it takes all these fundamental phenomena of nature and then somehow, you know, synthesizes an abstract understanding of them. So I, I'm a deep admirer of physics, actually. More questions? This gentleman here. Um, so if you, can, if you know the structure of a ribosome, could you theoretically recreate a ribosome and stimulate it to produce enzyme, uh, not, um, proteins artificially, for example, uh, for, uses, uh, for uses for other things? For example, like the, um, the bacteria Ideonella sacchiensis can produce enzymes to break down plastic. So could you artificially recreate its ribosomes and then use that to yeah. produce those enzymes? So that is actually, you know, Jason Chin, who's a colleague of mine at the LMB, is engineering ribosomes that will actually won't even start on the 
all of the thousands of messenger RNAs that the bacteria makes or the cell makes, but will only start on their own special mRNAs. And then he can modify these ribosomes so they can add what, what are called unnatural amino acids. That is not one of the 20 natural amino acids. So he can create proteins which have amino acids not found in nature. Now, those are still proteins in the sense they're amino acids and they're linked together by a peptide bond. But you could see in the future, you might be able to evolve or create a kind of ribosome that makes, up, makes an entirely different type of polymer. And so you never know where science is going to lead. I mean, in 20 or 30 years, we might be able to, using these ribosomes for ways, in ways that uh, we never could have anticipated. But one thing we would know is that these structures allowed us to think along those lines. And it is extraordinary the way that science, uh, you, you develop um, a, an answer to a problem, and yet the, the application of that piece of knowledge may be so far ahead. Yeah. And, and actually, we put our scientists in the position of making them say what impact they might have. Yeah, I mean, I, I've always felt this, this, you know, when you're doing curiosity-driven fundamental research, People should realize fundamental research has paid for itself many, many times over. And actually, any new transformative technology, whether it's electricity, which, you know, Michael Faraday, who lectured in this theater many times, he was asked, you know, what good is electricity? You know, because he had discovered electromagnetic induction. And he said, well, someday you may tax it. Well, nobody really, he didn't realize <laughs> that the tax on electricity today would be in the trillions of dollars, okay? And so I, I think, you know, but it took, you know, 50, 50 years after Faraday before it became a, a commercially viable uh, thing. And today, we, you know, this, this talk wouldn't be possible without electricity. Mm -hmm. So I think um, we understand. Another favorite example is when Newton discovered his laws of motion. He didn't imagine that 300 years later, those laws of motion would be used to launch satellites for communication. Okay, or here's the weirdest example, you know, special and general relativity by Einstein, you know, the fundamental fabric of space and time. It seemed so abstract. No one imagined it would have any applications uh, because it involved things that were traveling, you know, close to the speed of light and so on uh, to really be noticeable. But it turns out if you don't apply corrections from relativity for the time signals from satellites, your GPF will drift off by several hundred meters a day. And so, you know, you would not be able to use GPS on your phone without relativistic corrections. So who could have imagined that? You know? But it took 100 years before that application. Another question. Uh, there's one behind you here. Uh, were there any surprises, um, because the teams that you were talking about, they were mostly working on individually the 30S and 50S subunits. Were there any surprises in the structure of the whole ribosome put together? Well, there weren't any surprises, partly because we didn't know what it looked like. Okay, we had no idea what it looked like. So everything, in a sense, was a surprise. Uh, I think the way that the, these proteins sort of snake into the ribosome, the proteins that make up the ribosome itself, uh, you know, have these long extensions that help the RNA fold. I mean, th th that was really something that we hadn't quite anticipated. Uh, many of the motifs, the architectural motifs in the RNA that allow it to fold, you know, into this complicated structure, uh, those were all new. So you can think of it as new, uh, but in terms of surprise, I'm not so sure. Uh, one surprise was uh, came in the 30s, where we wanted to ask why is it so accurate uh, in in reading the code, and it turns out that it recognizes the shape of base pairs. So you know the RNA has three bases that are supposed to be red, and they're red by three bases that come in from this tRNA adapter molecule that brings along the amino acid to build a protein. And when these three bases meet the their their counterparts. They form base pairs, just like the base pairs in a DNA helix. Now, Jim Watson, uh, for all his uh, you know, 
character, characters, characteristics, shall we say, uh, was the guy who figured out that these bases, you know, like A forming a T or C forming a G, have exactly the same shape. So A, T, and C, G have the same shape as each other. And it turns out the ribosome actually recognizes the shape of these base pairs. And that wasn't really known uh, before these structures came out. And I guess it's the, when you see um, a long thing that's got to go in, and then you've got a tunnel shape, that kind of gives you some clue that what's going on. Yes. Yeah. Um, which, t sorry, which tunnel did you mean? Well, <laughs> just to, the, the, but when you're... You mean where the mRNA yes, goes yes, into yes, the yes, ribosome? Yes. Yeah, so, so, you know, it forms this channel. So, actually, you know, you can see in light blue, there's a snaky thing that goes into the yellow thing. So it's effectively going into a groove in the small subunit. So, so you know, the ribosome is, it's just, looks like this monstrous kludge, you know, so what's called a Rube Goldberg kind of machine, because that's what evolution is like. Evolution is, works by natural selection. It's not designed, you know, to be kind of some sleek thing. So it's this sort of messy looking big object, but, but the beauty is it works really well. And it works better than any protein synthesizer that humans have been able to design in the lab, you know, so, you know, you have to give nature some credit for it. And there you are, you heard it from the Nobel Prize winner, snaky thing, yellow thing. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Thank you. Um, this is a bit more of a technical question about actually cooling the crystals. Is there any reason why you used um, liquid nitrogen rather than cooling them more slowly and trying to sort of get a more um, perfect and bigger crystal? Would that not have been easier to see rather than cooling them more quickly and getting smaller, less perfect crystal forms? So, sorry, I, I didn't quite understand the question. Um, you, you said not to use liquid nitrogen, but what was the alternative? Um, well, I'm not really sure. Maybe something like sort of dry ice or sort of just do it more gradually. Oh, I see. No, than... Yeah, so no, that's true. So, so Jacques Dubouchet, who won the Nobel Prize last year uh, for electron microscopy, but actually this technique that he developed was essential for developing... Uh, cooling for crystallography as well, showed that you have to cool crystals to below 100 degrees or so Kelvin very quickly for the water not to form ice. The reason is that in a protein crystal, about half of the crystal is actually water because it's the water in between the molecules of the protein which are touching each other in just a few places. And all the spaces in between, there's water. Now, if you cool it to, say, dry ice, what will happen is the water will freeze, and it'll form ice crystals. And ice, as you know, expands compared to water. And so it'll shatter your protein crystal. So what you want to do is cool it so fast that the water doesn't form ice. It does something called, it, it, form, it vitrifies, which means it becomes like a glass. And that then doesn't expand, and it preserves the crystal in its original shape. And that, that was the key trick to getting these crystals to cool. Let me just go to your life after the Nobel Prize, because uh, it's, it's sort of constant publicity, it's constant travel, it's, it's constant uh, yeah. more rewards. If you get a Nobel Prize, it, there are more rewards I, I, to come. Yeah, there are, I, you know, so I have to tell, so I'll address both those questions. So first is, I, I talk in the book about what I call the Matthew effect. You know, this is after Matthew chapter 13, verse 12, which is, uh, to him who hath, more shall be given, and he shall have even more abundance. And from him who hath not, shall be taken away even that which he hath. <laughs> A rather harsh judgment. But you know, uh, what happens is you get the Nobel Prize, and suddenly, you know, all these societies want to make you an honorary fellow, and they give you all these you know, honorary, they want to give you honorary degrees and elect you to their, you know, academies and so on, and uh, invite you to all sorts of things. And it can really go to your head. And I call this disease, and many Nobel laureates have received the prize long after they're past their prime. And suddenly, you know, they're, they're in, their, in, in the limelight again, and they love it. They love all the adulation. They get mistaken for geniuses, which most of them are not. And, 
And so, you know, and everybody's hanging on every word that they say. So I call this a disease called post-nobilitis. Unlike pre-nobilitis, which is that anxiety that people have, am I going to get the prize or not? You know, that's, so, so they go spend all their time jetting around the world and giving talks and you know, being wined and dined. But you don't have to be like that. So I'll tell you one thing. When I became president of the Royal Society, my fellow officers were shocked because, uh, that is the other four vice presidents, they were shocked because I didn't have any frequent flyer status on any airline. You know, not silver, not bronze, nothing, you know? And the reason was, I didn't really, I, I would just say no to most things. And we, our productivity after the prize was actually just, the, the five years after the prize was better than the five years just before the prize. So it's really very much up to you how you want to live your life. Of course, that's changed now because as president of the Royal Society, I did go from nothing to gold in a year, I should say. <laughs> but because you do have to represent the Royal Society and you do have to uh, you know, travel, that's part of your job. It's, if you take it on, you have to, you know, the, you, that's part of your responsibility. But um, I, I do take a, make a crack about the Royal Society as well because I said, you know, one of the most unlikely honors. I mean, here I was a lab rat at the LMB, you know, mostly known for his work on the ribosome. And suddenly somebody calls me up and asks me if I want to be president of the Royal Society, you know. Well, yeah. how given, unlikely was that? You know, and given its pedigree, you know, who am I to say no, right? I mean, you know, so as, as my, my sister had a f sister's professor, my sister's also, a, she's a, quite a well known TV scientist, but her professor, said that whenever he got an honor, his mother would say, well, better you than some stranger. So that was sort of my attitude, you know? <laughs> but I thought it was a very odd thing. And I actually told them, look, you know, are you sure? And, and by the way, you mentioned Vera, and Vera's reaction was, do they have any idea what you're really like? <laughs> and so, yeah, I'm loving Vera. I'm loving Vera. <laughs> so anyway, so I, I told them all, I said, look, you know, I'm not a mover and shaker, and I, I haven't had any you know, broad leadership experience. And I didn't grow up in Britain, so I don't have this extensive network of contacts and so on. But they sort of ignored all my objections. And I said, they elected me in what I think of as their typical North Korean style election with only one name on the ballot. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's a little wicked of me. <laughs> Well, thank you. I, I don't know about you, but I've just, it, it's been such a pleasure d listening to you. I've so enjoyed uh, talking to you. And I'm going to go on and go back to his book again. Uh, do read it because I just think it's not just this fantastic sort of gripping read about the race uh, to uh, uncover the structure of the ribosome, but I think it does give you a really good insight into how science is done and how technology moves on and suddenly makes problems attractable. And now Richard Henderson, with his Nobel Prize last year, invent, the inventor of something that now makes decoding structure much easier. Much easier. So it, it's a constant march. Um, and it's been a pleasure to be with you this evening. Thank you very much. I've really Thank enjoyed you. it.